Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak in your wonderful city. Uh, tricky city, I already got two uh, tickets yeah, with my uh, standard size SUV, which was probably a bad choice for this city. Um, but however, I'm going to talk about... Um, oh, Hebrew is gone, I guess. Yeah, you still have the screen. Oh, perfect. So I'm going to talk about the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network encryption and authentication. Um, first, I'm going to tell you who I am and what I am not. I'm not a cryptographer, uh, nor am I an economist. I'm also not Mr. Know Everything. So, um, who am I? Um, I'm the guy who's trying to get it done, uh, try to roll it forward who uh, wants to connect the right people to get this thing done. Uh, the whole thing I'm going to present now is not an idea that spun up only in my head or even in my head. It's uh, ideas that are floating around since years. And yeah, let me try to dive in. So we all know the Bitcoin network is a bunch of peers. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And the whole traffic is unencrypted, which maybe makes sense because we we, uh, what, what do we transact? It's transactions of blocks. They're going to end up uh, in the public blockchain anyway. So why bother uh, with encryption? Um, we can have the first look at SPV, which is kind of the worst case uh, thing. Um, we know there's a bunch of uh, smartphones running around with SPV wallets, and they communicate with boom filters about their wallet uh, heuristics. And at least since Jonas Nick presented or uh, created that paper about uh, de-anonymized uh, SPV wallet uh, users, we know that th that part of information is not really public or not supposed to be public. It's private information. And what we actually do is we allow every network authority, ISPs, Wi-Fi providers to analyze your whole financial history and your future payments which is probably not what we want. And uh, there's a new proposal from Wallo presented recently, uh, the client-side filtering. It's also not, thing that is not that something that's really new. Um, but even there, um, it may be not really public um, what we're going to fetch. So assume you have the filters, you find out which blocks are relevant to you. If you just download maybe you have two transactions and you download one or two blocks, it's very obvious in what selections of addresses you run. So even there, it's maybe worth if you have like a designated peer connection to not reveal this information. And if you do kind of the full block SPV, you download the whole chain or uh, in general, then there's even a little bit of information you're going to share, which is the starting height. Shouldn't hurt too much, but maybe that's also kind of a little benefit. Uh, right now we know there's ISP between peers and those ISP have full possibility to uh, grab the traffic without you knowing that or without the peers knowing that. They can even, ta even tamper or kind of manipulate packages without you being capable of detecting that. Um, runs pretty good if no ISP is malicious. We don't know. Um, there's other cases where we have malicious peers that has been done in the past. A good example was how long was it ago? One or two years when uh, one of these chain analyzes, I think it was chain analyzes, uh, started to bootstrap a bunch of peers to analyze where transactions come from. Um, there's little we can do with encryption, um, with pure encryption. But there's other proposals who work in, in, into that direction, but encryption certainly helps. And also since the paper of Offpost, Tolaki, Sohar and Vandeweer uh, about the uh, PGP routing partitioning attacks, we know it's simple for ISPs or for any network participants to delay blocks. Let's say we, they could delay certain miners so they get blocks later if they would use standard transactions. Um, they can even partition you by action or by uh, intentionally um, give you or kind of uh, send you wrong information from certain peers, so you will disconnect those peers. 
Um, this is relatively trivial at the moment because there is no authentication, no map between or added to the packages. Um, if you look at, again, the SPB problem, which is the simplest one to understand, you're going to share information uh, and, and the man in the middle can, can uh, intercept the information together often with your, uh, with your uh, rest of the, or the internet behavior. If you're going to uh, download or purchase certain things on the internet, they may collect the whole uh, transaction history, including your personal profile. And also the same paper of, uh, of Sohar van der Berg showed that um, 13 ISP host 30% of, uh, of the peers. So that's kind of frightening. But even more frightening is that 60% of the possible Bitcoin connections cross three ISPs. So if these three ISPs come together, they can manipulate and intercept 60% uh, of the whole Bitcoin traffic. And so we, we are talking about passive interception, which means you don't know if they're intercepted. You have no possibilities to know that or to find out if it's intercepted or not. And undetectable message manipulation. Message manipulation. This is the current state. It allows to de-anonymize de users, uh, force delays, force disconnects, and all these routing PGP partitioning attacks. So yeah, we know unencrypted means for an SPV user, um, you're going to lose a lot of private information. So that's, okay, back here. Um, that's why BIP 151 was proposed. It's a community proposal, and it allows to create secure channels between peers. So it doesn't allow you to, um, have full man in the middle protection, so you're still connecting to peers. If the peer is malicious, you don't know, but at least a uh, 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 network authority has no longer the possibility to intercept and manipulate messages. How does it work? So, a bit more technical, I hope you don't mind. Um, it's still kind of high level. Uh, what it does, it's a standard form of uh, creating a secure channel. There is uh, two session keys created on each side, or four, two for each direction, uh, or one for each direction. So there's an ephemeral session key created and shared over the uh, EC Daffy Hellman key exchange in order to uh, calculate the shared secret on both sides. And you know probably that this is. Uh, uh, that there is still the possibility of an active man in the middle, which means a malicious peer or even an ISP can spawn up a peer. You think you're talking to the right peer, but you're actually talking to the ISP, and the ISP is proxying it uh, forward to, uh, to the peer you have had the idea to connect to. So this means they can sub substitute keys in both directions and be kind of, you know, the middleman and collect everything and tamper everything. So. But a very different, uh, a very uh, important differentiation is it's detectable. So simple, um, or imagine peer A would call peer B, which he had planned to connect to, and ask, what is your session ID? And if the session ID is not, uh, not identical, you know someone is in the middle. So it's easy detectable. I mean, obviously not our phone lines, uh, but it's in, in, in theory easily detectable, which means um, if something is detectable in surveillance uh, theor uh, theor uh, territory, then it's quite um, not ideal to intercept those connections. Um, a good example is how SSH does that. If you first, if you connect to a host first time, you maybe remember uh, there is kind of this fingerprint shown to you. Do you want to connect to fingerprint uh, X, Y, Z? You press yes. Nobody verifies those fingerprints. Maybe who verifies those fingerprints? Oh, good. Yeah, not real, <laughs> always. Uh, but most people always come, yes, that's good. That's my host. Uh, and then once you have connected, it stores the fingerprint in that file, no hosts. 
And if the fingerprint changes, which is kind of a nanny mill situation, kind of get, gets a big warning and then you need to delete that line and everything is good again. Sure. <laughs> um, this is called tofu. This is just the, the concept of trust on first use. So if your first connection is ma man in the middle, then you screw, you know, the fingerprint, you, you cannot verify. You, you need to kind of log in over a secure channel you already have to the server and verify the fingerprint. Um, BIP 151 has no tofu concept. It will maybe add one, but at the moment there is no tofu concept and I think it's also good that, that it doesn't have one. So the details about the key exchange, um, it's the, the Daffy Hellman key ex exchange is also based on uh, SecP to 56 k one it's the same curve. There's no new uh, crypto uh, library involved, we can use what we have already uh, to do the uh, ECDH, and there is a key exchange in both directions. Kind of sends you an ink init package, you get an ink act, and then an ink act package with the pop key of the remote host, and you do the same in the opposite direction in order to have two shared secrets uh, in both directions, or one for each direction. And once that handshake has been done, there is no more plain text packages allowed. So uh, ideally, you do that first, even before you do the version package, and then from that point, everything is encrypted. There's no, no possibility to tamper with it. And uh, BIP 151 has a flexible uh, symmetric scheme number, so it's possible to add another uh, symmetric uh, cipher. Right now, there is one proposed, which is the, the Charles Charles 20, 40, 30, 0, 5. Um, it's, it's also stream receiver, similar to AES uh, GCM, um, which allows fast stream encryption. It's, it's based on 256 keys, so it's pretty secure. Uh, and it, with the poly 1305, it, it forms the A, A, e, A, D, <coughs> with the MAC tag to uh, uh, really makes it robust. Uh, there are uh, kind of the proposal in the BIP 151 proposal, we are using the open SSH uh, variant of, of Jojo 20 5 It's slightly different to the uh, to Adam Langley's proposal, the RFC, the IETF RFC. Um, additionally, and it encrypts the length, so you, you can add uh, the package have an encrypted length, so you can kind of, you know, in Bitcoin packages, size is very, uh, it shows pretty quick what it is, is it an int, is it a block, um, so you can encrypt the length, <coughs> and it's also a slightly different way how the Mac is calculated uh, in the open SSH variant. So it's not that much, so you, you maybe think of crypto, thousands of lines of codes, uh, of code, so it's actually uh, roughly 400 lines of code, I think even including tests. Um, so it's not so complicated and that's not own cooked crypto, it's crypto known already and used, example by Google a lot, used in OpenSSH and the implementation has already been ripped out of OpenSSH to start building on top of it. Um, once we have the shared secret and the cipher type, we can derive keys with uh, HKDF, which is a form of key derivation. And this allows us to generate two keys. We need two keys, one for the symmetric encryption and the other for the MAC tag. And the proposal also says there should be rekeying done. It's a peer policy. With certain boundaries, but this peer policy. So you peer can say, I want to rekey every 10 minutes or every here and there uh, amount of bytes. The BIP only says that there is a rekeying, has to be rekeying of, of the one gigabyte of data and not more often than 10, every 10 seconds. This is pretty much what the SSH is also using. It allows to rekey and then to have to forward see to see that if someone has grabbed uh, your symmetric receiver um, key after the rekeying, it's going to be again not cracking. And the big thing, what I really like, um, we can have a new message structure. 
if you're familiar with the peer-to-peer -peer protocol of Bitcoin, uh, there is kind of the fixed message structure, which uh, at the moment is the four-byte magic that kind of indicates on what network you are. And there is 12 bytes fixed length command, like int, block, get headers, whatever. And there is the length of the payload, and then there is the checksum, very important, and the payload itself. Um, once we establish encryption, we can use whatever we want because it's clear that we can't have a new package structure at that point. So the idea is that you have the encrypted length, the encrypted payload, and the MAC tag. And within the encrypted payload, we can have multiple packages. And those packages have a slightly different form. This is the example of an inf uh, package. So before uh, BIP 151, the current state, we have the magic, always the same. Then we have 12 byte command, which is kind of a lot of null bytes if we have an inf, it's three bytes. And also we have seen in the past that some clients uh, filled up after the null byte, filled up some random data, probably some private keys. And then there is the length, the checksum, so it comes up to roughly 61 bytes. Uh, with encryption, we can drop the magic, and we can drop the checksum, very important, and we come down to, with the Mac tag, to roughly 65 bytes, so it's not much larger. And so you may say, what about performance? Because encryption is always like, slows you down endlessly, towards a good example. Um, but no, I don't think so. Um, I took the Crypto++ benchmark. Uh, here we can see, um, maybe before that, we need to know what every Bitcoin package does a two round SHA-256 on the whole package in order to get you a four byte checksum. It's quite expensive. Um, crypto++ crypto benchmark states it's 13.4 cycles per byte for a SHA-256 which means it's 26.8 cycles. Maybe not, people are already nuts. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's worse, maybe it's better. But I, th I think these numbers are quite uh, optimistic. But it shows us that it won't be much slower, it may be even faster to do it uh, in the encrypted fashion. So what are the downsides? Um, well, we have to know it's still a draft proposal. Um, there's nothing made into stones. There's still plenty of time to overhaul, to kind of get some feedback. Uh, we know that SECP256K1 is not quantum crypto safe, what people told me. Um, there are proposals to do so, or there are other regimes that are, uh, that should be quantum crypto safe. Um, so this is something that is built into that proposal. There's all the criticism. Um, so some people, or not, not sure if it's just one or some, uh, <laughs> said false sense of security, which, yeah, I, I kind of agree. If you say that's encrypted, is it really encrypted? But let me go back for that uh, to sh give you a little example. Um, the sense of security, if you say, okay, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Yeah, we, 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 we all use Signal because it's end-to-end -end encrypted, bulletproof. But what means end-to-end -end encrypted? It means end-to-end -end encrypted. What is if the end is not really safe? And I mean, iPhone, Android, is it safe? I mean, there's clear evidence it's not safe. So. Um, that's always, that should always be known that end-to-end -end encryption doesn't mean that the end is safe. So, um, to go back to that. Um, false sense of security, yes. Uh, secure channel doesn't mean you speak to the right peer automatically. It's still an active man in the middle possibility. Um, some people said, or even again one, there is no private information in the traffic that is passed between peers. I slightly disagree. There are some private puzzle pieces that maybe desire or uh, deserve encryption. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol should not be driven by the needs of a client-server system. 
because obviously kind of that sort of encryption also invites to have like a designated node connection. You, for example, you have a node at home, you want to connect your uh, smartphone with that node at home, which is often the feature as we wallets are adding today. Um, without encryption, it's kind of uh, impossible to do it in a safe way. Um, but some people said we shouldn't extend the peer-to-peer -peer protocol to, to do that client server thing. I also disagree there because I'm a practical guy. I think if it's possible to do peer-to-peer -peer connections in a safe way, why not using the same channel uh, to allow like client server uh, connection? The users really, really be thankful to not set up a different channel, different IP, different whatever, S tunnel, Tor. It's just not, not scalable. So, uh, advantages, as I said, it eliminates passive interception, which I think is a, it's a great deal. It eliminates untraceable or undetectable package manipulation. Reduce attack surfaces for these uh, partitioning, PGP sort of attacks. And it builds a base for secure node-to-node -node communication, which is already happening. So um, if you have, if you know Bitcoin Core, there's a white bind, add node thing. People are creating uh, designated peer connections. Uh, there's Fiber. I don't know the authentication system of uh, Fiber. Is it called Fiber or Fiber? Fiber. 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 <laughs> fiber. Okay. And it so, uses Polygrip. Uh, Last time I checked, it was just a symmetric single a, passphrase. Passphrase. So I'm not sure if it's really undetectable package manipulations. So yeah, I think all these sort of channel connections, uh, we need something like that because people rely on connecting to a designated IP. But there's actually no guarantee that you have connected to those peers. So people told also, why not use the open SSL? It's already there, it works. Um, it won't be possible, sure. Um, this is kind of a joke, but um, an important one. So this is the vulnerability list, which has that slide, the really small slider on the top right, uh, which the history of open SSL is not particularly good. Um, also, what's in there is way too much for Bitcoin, and Bitcoin made good experience with using well-known crypto um, in its own uh, dependency chain or in its own source code base. Why not use Tor? Uh, would work. Tor works for an end-to-end -end encryption, um, but it's another layer. It's not made for what we want to do or not designed or made for that. Um, Astal would also work, but the setup yeah, cumbersome. Can you do it on a, on a smartphone? Maybe for some experts, front row again. Um, so yes, then another proposal which has been kind of split off of the encryption is the authentication, which means um, making sure you are connected to the right peer. I showed you like that landline call to the peer where you can verify the session ID. This is basically the proposal to have that built in. Uh, what does it? It, it avoids um, kind of that active man in the middle situation. It's useful for whitelisting peers, like these fiber-like connections. And it would allow, not sure if you want, but it would allow private peer-to-peer -peer extensions. You could say, um, my peer wants to serve fee estimations. Um, I could allow that for a certain amount of, of, of peers. So that's again then the client-server thing which is maybe controversial, but maybe good. We don't know yet. Uh, the properties, um, BIP 150 expects pre-shared keys. So uh, if you kind of connect to your node at home, you have to pre-share keys over a kind of secure channel you already have. Um, if you connect to a friend's peer or a well-known peer, you need to get like the identity key on a different channel. Uh, it also uses um, SECP 256K1, so same curve, no new dependencies, and uh, the special thing which mainly uh, Greg Maxwell came up with is the fingerprinting-free authentication, which I think it's really great thing, and here we can also see the 
advantage of not using uh, existing solutions. So it's important to know that uh, that form of authentication doesn't reveal who you are until the other side has proven they know you already, which is the fingerprint of free authentication. So for that, uh, if you connect a peer, you will first only show them um, only show them um, a hash of who you think they are, and they can verify that and let you in. Um, here we have the whole chain, which is probably better. So for that, uh, the connecting peer sends you a hash of the encryption session, which is part of the thing I showed you before, uh, where you can kind of have a landline call and verify the session ID, and then you add like the remote expected identity key in a hash. So the remote peer can verify if the connecting peer really knows me already, and if so, they give you back the signature. And the signature obviously is fingerprintable, um, but it only happens if the connecting peer has already been, already been proven they know you. The same then on the other side, and at the end you have like a state where you know the peer you're connecting to, or you have a kind of assured that the peer you're connecting to is the peer you have the pre-shared key, and same for the other side. Um, but again, those are optional proposals. That's not something that rolls out as a soft fork or, or something like that. It's optional proposals. It's not consensus critical. Um, you don't need to use it. You can. And we have to know, as I already said, authentication is already happening. So there's already uh, kind of fixed channels we're building over that peer-to-peer -peer network. Next steps, um, yeah, implementation, hopefully. Um, there's a lot of going on in Bitcoin Core right now with network refactoring. Once that has been kind of settled, um, we can move on with implementing these things. Uh, some guys at the front row have already signaled that they will maybe implement it, hopefully. <laughs> and there are other things which may be critical for the overall security in terms of partitioning attacks and those things. Um, another puzzle, which is not really ideal, is the, the DNS seeds. First time you start up Bitcoin Core node, uh, it will get IPs over a DNS channel. And this is also easy to tamper with. So uh, ideally, somebody could really kind of partition you to a certain edge of the network. And this maybe desires or deserves also some sort <laughs> of authentication. This is another puzzle piece. Yeah, that was pretty quick. I hope you have some questions. Oh, can you guys wait for the mic, please? <laughs> It, is this uh, being designed in such a way that uh, Tor, for example, could use it as a form of protocol obfuscation? Uh, not yet. It's quite um, made for the use case we have, but happy if you hold the proposal. When it comes to the encryption, you talked a lot about uh, the use case of uh, the SPV. Is that a problem for non-SPVs as well, for regular nodes? And, and the second part of the question is, how many nodes is an SPV usually connected to? Uh, I would say it's also a problem for the entire network, uh, not really the only SPV. As we, uh, as we have seen, there's the PGP, <coughs> attack possibilities, there's like a delay uh, possibility, 
um, or just as the, the chain analysis that could help from encryption. Um, SP wallets usually are connected to six, eight peers, four, Peter says, so that is fine. Yeah. Uh, not thousands, yeah, <laughs> just a bunch of them. Just a minor question. Was there, you, know, you ended up with a solution that's 65 bytes. Um, are there any other particular, you know, for censorship resistance or filter resistance reasons, um, you know, are any of the other encrypted uh, protocols also using 65 bytes? For you mean those 65 bytes? Um, I think that's just an example for the int package. Um, Yes, I hope it's it's calculated correctly. But I mean, other other packages will. I mean, the inf is short. You know, it's just a three. You, you get like four instead of twelve bytes for the command. So longer will not really uh, reduce it that much. Or that much in the line. Hi. On the subject, but a little off of it. Some years ago, I saw a code that was totally un unencryptable. You, it, it, it's not a secret. It, 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 you know, yada yada yada. It, it was long. Do you think that's possible? I couldn't get your question. Could you it, is a code impossible to an encrypt? If there is a code impossible to encrypt, not to decrypt, right? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. I think you you can encrypt. There's nothing you, you can't encrypt. Hopefully. <laughs> I was hoping. At least, on, at least in, in terms of Bitcoin packages, I guess. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about the... Hey, Hi, Torres. Uh, about the kind of layer violation going on between the, the negotiation at, at, uh, um, like up, up, up the header and then having to come back and, and kind of keep some state at, at, the, at the network. Have you have you have you looked at like kind of abusing the current header structure so that you, so so basically imagine that the, the 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 networking part the kind of dissecting the header and 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 um, separating the payload and boarding it along imagine if that were like done in hardware where that's I mean it's obviously not going to be but just for, for the for the sake of example so. As, as you've laid out, it seems like you have to kind of pass up in order to de decode the message or, or, or you know, um, uh, understand that the setup is being done and send it back kind of to the, to the networking layer to, to have it set up there. I'm, I'm just wondering if it's, if it's kind of possible to separate those two layers or, or how much you've considered it. I really see what you're thinking, you're thinking already in lines of code, uh, which is good. And I think we will have the time the next uh, days to, to talk about that. And I think we, we can improve the proposal, for sure. So, from what I just seen, that I saw that you just said that through, on the handshake process, there's still a couple of vulnerabilities into um, being able to not being able to talk with the, the peer if the ISP is, is on the handshake process. Is that correct what I'm saying or I just didn't understand what is the whole it, it, it's, it's It's always like if you take SSL or SSH as an example, SSL solves it over these chains, you know, the certificate chains, of the certificate authorities. SSH solves it over that uh, uh, pinning down token concept of the, uh, the, the remote identity key. Um, both are not fully uh, preventing you from active man in the middle. So um, there's, it's always a problem. Correct. Peter may have a more precise answer. So thank you. If Jonas was talking about two different proposals, first one to set up. Um, an encrypted channel between two peers, and then secondly, a step to authenticate to check whether you're talking to the right one. If you're not using the authentication proposal, then of course, 
just encrypting your connection doesn't lead to anything if you don't know who you're talking to. Your ISP could just be running a node and you're talking to the node of your ISP. Um, so if you're purely talking about the encryption step, it is it makes certain attacks harder, but it really doesn't prevent anything at all. However, once you use the authentication proposal, these, these problems go away. If, if I have verified with you in person, like, hey, this is the key of my, my node, and you use the authentication proposal to verify and configure our nodes that we're going to connect, th then that problem does go away. But, yeah, I would like to clarify. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but the, 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 the pure encryption does have the advantage of blocking purely passive observer, which is cheap to do, and it makes them detectable, which changes the threat model, right? If an ISP were monitoring all Bitcoin uh, connections today, you couldn't tell that they were doing it. But with the encryption, even without the authentication, there's a risk that a couple of super geeks like us will compare our session IDs and blow the cover on that. And that's, uh, that is a useful piece of, uh, of, of, of machinery to have in the system, even without the off part. And I know Peter knows this, but. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any thoughts towards uh, like extending some model of a web of trust? So I don't have to directly authenticate notes that I'm to, but I could potentially uh, pass them a signature and then you know my friends could connect to notes that I already trust. It's a possible extension, but first we need to build those puzzles, I think. But right now there's nothing built into that kind of allows identities to circulate. I can answer. <laughs> yeah, so part of the reason for this split between the encryption and authentication part is that there can be multiple different authentication parts, so we don't have to stop at just the 151. We could have many different authentication schemes that that people could use. Now, I don't know if a web of trust thing would ever be useful given the nature of the Bitcoin network, but maybe for transaction relay it might be interesting to have. But whatever cool authentication ideas people have, they can just be dropped into the scheme and right atop the same encryption layer that's already in place. So it seems that there's sort of, there's two um, or maybe three states. Uh, you know, you've talked about, you know, you've got an ongoing relationship with other peers, you, you have, you know, got a, uh, a uh, uh, you can check their identities, whatever, but there's also the initial setup. You know, you have a node that's never been, um, uh, you know, hasn't talked to the network in a long time, or is a brand new node. Um, are, are there, you know, I guess one of my concerns would be early on, you know, establishing the network. Um, has there been some discussion about improving the performance there, or um, uh, you know, besides DNSSEC, which I, I've only been seeing promising it for what pretty much my whole career, yeah. uh, 30 plus years. Yeah, I think there are some discussions about that. Um, I mean, DNSC has that kind of layer of uh, anon anonymity, which is you know, per se good. Uh, sometimes I think maybe it would be more uh, desirable to first use the static local IP list. Uh, but yeah, I think there's, um, it's, it's a piece we need, it's a piece we don't probably like. Uh, but that's just the nature of the peer-to-peer -peer system that you need to get kind of a first kickstart bunch of addresses, which are hopefully kind of from all over the peer-to-peer the -peer network. The network's still anonymous and identityless, so we don't really need to bootstrap identities into the system. This isn't an effort to add identities to the Bitcoin protocol, except in areas where people would already be manually connected to IPs. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, maybe I missed this, but does a node signal that? Uh, does this does a node signal this with like a service pit, or is this on a separate port? And if you add more ciphers, how would that work? You mean how to announce you can do encryption or? Yeah, when you connect to a node uh, to know whether it's possible to do it. 
Yeah, that's a part I'm not sure if the current state of the proposal is really good because right now uh, the proposal says you have to do it before the version handshake, so there's actually no, no uh, service bits uh, transmitted beforehand. So either you try encryption by sending an encryption package, an encryption handshake initiation, and if the peer uh, kind of ignores or disconnect you, you know, you can reconnect and don't try it again. Uh, it's not ideal. Um, we could say we do it after the version, and then use kind of a, a service bit, which maybe is better. Uh, but ideally, you encrypt at the very first point. Uh, so Would it makes sense for nodes to listen on multiple ports. What was it? Sorry, what was that? Would it make sense for nodes to listen on multiple ports where one is? Uh, it's then very obvious that you have what version, and but yeah, maybe. Um, would you say that encrypting the traffic of the Bitcoin network uh, will bring further state attention to the Bitcoin network? Uh, I don't think so. I think um, kind of having um, undetectable transactions like Zcash and stuff, that's more uh, kind of ringing the alarm clocks there. I think pure encryption, no, I don't. So they probably expect that this will happen at some point. How do you decide how often or when to check session IDs? Sorry, say it again? How do you decide how often or when to check session IDs? Uh, the current 150 proposal only checks it at the beginning. And from that point, uh, there's the rekeying. It has a, there's also the rekeying that has to be done once the session ID has been checked. And from that on, um, there's kind of the chain of the keys that goes back to the initial detection. Yeah, um, if, you're, if you're doing it manually, how paranoid are you? <laughs> <laughs> but you could, yeah. You could, I mean, the host could have been changed on the delivery, but very unlikely. Yeah, no. I mean, you could just manually check. I think. Do you mean to make sure two nodes have the same session ID, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do it every once in a while. Right. If you only have one connection up, there's no way a man in the middle came into an existing connection. So it's only when you bring up a new connection, you could have been man in the middle. Look at it once a week, once a month. If only a tiny number of users check those session IDs with other nodes, no tier one ISP or whatever could be intercepting on a wide scale basis. So even a tiny amount of checking is enough to prevent global observation. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with regards to the uh, checking with the session IDs are the same, if you, uh, if an attacker say knows that you're only going to be checking like the first digit of the session ID, are they able to get beef it or no? Yeah, if an attacker knew that you were going to check only the first digit of the session ID, then they could grind one. But if the attacker doesn't know what you're going to check, or even if you're going to check, that's sort of massively hard for them, because they might be possible. Uh, I would even say the, the, the pure fact that it is detectable reduces the attack surface yeah. enormous. Yeah. And even that fact alone is worth uh, doing, in my opinion. More questions? John has one. Uh, do, you, do you foresee this being the norm for P2P connections between peers in general on the network, or just for FTP clients? No, I hope, uh, I hope it's, it will be the norm, especially if you can increase a performance by dropping the shot to 56. You may can. And um, I think it will be the standard ones for uh, connections. Are there any more questions?